Hey guys, so I am on sabbatical, which means I'm supposed to be taking a break from all things churchy, but when Reverend Stephanie Kendall uh, talked about the Hamilton Sunday that she was doing and said that she still had a few spots open, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to do two of the things that I love the most, which is talk about Hamilton and talk about the Bible. And so I figured, since I didn't have a church this Sunday, and since it's inevitable that I will eventually become some sort of lifestyle or makeup vlogger, I would do it in this format, which is sitting in my mom's living room, um, staring at my phone, talking to the people in my life who either really love me or really love Hamilton or the two of you for whom that is an intersection of both. Um, so this is um, a group of people around the country that are preaching this Sunday on Hamilton, um, the songs from Hamilton, each of us got a song. And then the churches that are involved are donating some of their proceeds to um, the Hispanic Federation who does work with immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees. Since I am not preaching at a church this Sunday and not taking up a collection, there's going to be a link wherever uh, you saw this posted. And uh, I encourage you all to donate if you liked what I did here. Um, and if you didn't like what I did here, you should still donate because it's not their fault that you didn't like it. Um, and so uh, I'm also going to encourage you to take a pause here and go listen to the song, Say No to This from Hamilton. I will also provide a link to that um, so that you can be caught up on what I'm going to be talking about, unless you have the whole thing memorized from beginning to end and then you can just keep watching, okay? So with that, I'm going to read the scripture and then get started on what I have to say. Um, the scripture lesson that I am pairing with Say No to This is from John chapter eight, one through 11. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now the law in Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and from now on, do not sin again. The stories of political affairs are always fascinating to us. They have captured the public imagination for as long as political affairs have existed, which is as long as men have had power. So obviously it did not take America very long to have its first torrid affair play out on the public stage. It took exactly two presidents, two. And if we are being precise, the affair actually happened while the first president was still in office. And of course, the tale as it is told is the story of a woman whose appeal was so strong that it brought down a would-be president. Poor Alexander Hamilton was just so incredibly helpless. Now, the line between Jezebel and Mother Mary has always been a lot thinner than we pretend it is. The line that separates Mariah Reynolds and Eliza Hamilton is proximity to money and power and the desperation that being on the wrong side of it can bring. Mariah Reynolds was 23 years old when she met Alexander Hamilton. She was al he was already the Secretary of Treasury. He was already wealthy and powerful. Her husband was known for being a criminal. He was known for mistreating her and he had abandoned her. She needed money to get back to the friends and family who could care for her. 
Alexander didn't want to give her the money right then because his wife was at home. And, you know, good upstanding men cannot give women money in front of their wives. That's just basic decency, right? So he offered, like any gentleman would, to come by her house later that night when both of them were alone. But his narrative, like any upstanding man's would be, was that the seduction was all her idea. In this passage from the Gospel of John, Jesus is being given a fairly easy test. And the Pharisees have seen enough of Jesus that I have to imagine they think he'll fail it. The passage says that they are hoping to have something to charge him with. So they know this is an easy test, but they're pretty sure that he's going to bomb it. So there's something that they're angling for. And it's not that they think that he's ignorant of the laws. I mean, maybe, but they've been following him, so they know that he's really well-versed in the Hebrew scripture. I think that they're betting on his compassion and that that is what is going to break God's law. They're hoping that his mercy for this woman is what's going to violate God's word. I'm pretty sure that they're certain that it's going to be a display of grace that will blaspheme God's order. They bring a woman before him who was apparently caught in the act of adultery all by herself, and they are prepared to murder her for this. Jesus's response, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, is something that is fairly well known. It speaks to our willingness to, as my friend, the Reverend Elizabeth Wright put it, exercise our own demons uh, through other people's sins. And Jesus was not willing to be a participant in that gross display. But I'm also interested in one scholar's reading that a faithful interpretation would be that Jesus said, let he who has not committed this particular sin cast the first stone. Because the man that she committed adultery with was likely in the crowd. And Jesus knew that men with money and power often abuse their power in many ways, but often abuse their power in this particular way. Maybe he had leaned down and began a list of the names of women they'd coerced into bed with promises of financial security, with promises of political favor or freedom from harsher punishments for laws that they had broken. Maybe they had realized in that moment that dragging sins into open air in the public square was never actually a good idea. Now, if only Alexander Hamilton had actually realized that. Alexander was exactly as cliche as every other story that made news in ancient gossip circles and makes the news today. Men in power having consensual affairs with women that just needed to be rescued in undeniably predictable circumstances is really a result of this thin line between Jezebel and Mother Mary. These men's egos are inflated by the heroic nature of becoming saviors. They find their virtue in rescuing, and if we're being really honest, exploiting these women that they have labeled as good and virtuous, but damaged and needy. And when they stop receiving their hero fix, the women stop serving as a Mother Mary and become a Jezebel that caused the downfall of these powerful men. They become these masterminds that had it all planned from the very beginning. And these men, these poor, poor men, were just helpless pawns that couldn't resist these women's charms. This binary view of women as either pure or sinful and men as being entirely absent from the decision altogether, having absolutely no agency in the affairs or in anything that happened before or after it, have devastating consequences both then and now. Honor killings, death by stoning, still happens around the world and absolutely disproportionately impacts women. Story after story of men walking away from horrific sexual assaults on women with little to no punishment move in and out of our news cycles with regularity. When women's humanity is stripped away and they are seen as simply virgin or whore, we cannot be surprised by the Me Too movement where men believed they were owed sex for jobs that they controlled. When women are only virgin or whore, 
we aren't allowed to be equal partners in consensual sexual relationships. We either need to be coerced or we are an untrustworthy temptress, not deserving of love or respect. The church's refusal to acknowledge a middle ground is a refusal to see us as God, part of God's full creation. Alexander Hamilton realized that he needed to save his reputation because it was better to be seen as an adulterer than a thief. So he published the details of his affair when he was being accused of financial mismanagement. Mariah Reynolds, now divorced and remarried, had to flee the country because the public scorn against her was so great. Hamilton actually survived that scandal and maintained significant influence in the Adams administration. It was his later direct attacks on John Adams, leading to the Federalist loss of the presidency that led to his actual political downfall. In his song, Say No to This, Hamilton sings, I don't know how to say no to this, over and over, as if no isn't a simple word that is also a complete and full sentence. Jesus, in reminding the Pharisees and scribes of their own imperfection, forces them to remember that the woman did not get there on her own. In commanding her to go and sin no more, I think he is asking her to try to find a better way to honor herself. He's not calling her a virgin, and he's not calling her a whore, but he might be suggesting that the choice she's been making might not be the one to make anymore. He can't be there for her the next time. We have to find a way to have better conversations about what it means to put down our, sin, our stones and sin no more. What would it mean if we demanded that men find their virtue in themselves and not the women that they rescue into bed? What would it mean if we demanded that men see women as fully created by God, equal in God's sight and therefore equal in their sight? What would it mean if men started to take responsibility for their own sex scandals? What would it mean if men just didn't create their own sex scandals? What if we really learned to make use of the word no and learn to hear it as a full sentence? Because my friends, it makes the word yes so much better when we do. Mariah Reynolds returned to the States after a few years and one more name change. She worked as a housekeeper. Her daughter attended a private boarding school and received a proper education, which was rare for a woman in that time. This education for her daughter was arranged by the same man who helped her get her divorce from James Reynolds, Mr. Aaron Burr. Eventually, Mariah married the doctor that she was keeping house for. She found religion, and as all good people do in the end, she became a Methodist. Jesus never really expected us to be sinless. However, that's not an excuse for us to run wild either. Christ wanted us to be a community that didn't use our sins as weapons against each other, that didn't hold up our righteousness as measuring sticks, ignoring the pain that we'd caused or the shame that we are hiding. Go and sin no more is a goal that we are striving for. The excuses we create for bad behavior, the societal walls that we build up around power and privilege that just expects certain people to cause harm, that is counter to the gospel message. God demands that we do better, both as individuals and in the ways that we hold each other accountable. But we also find our hope in a God who has the ability to write all of our sins in the dirt, but chooses to forget them instead. God instead chooses to invite us to walk in a new path. So today, I'm inviting you to put down the stones that you've been aching to throw at someone, or the ones that you've been clutching as you remember your own sins and instead to commit your time to becoming the whole person that God created you to be. Amen.